chapter 2, 22 of Revelation, this incredible book, the book of Revelation, John the Apostle, being given this incredible vision of the Isle of Patmos. So we're coming almost to the conclusion. This will be the second last sermon on Revelation from me. And the next one, next month, in the Lord, Lord will probably be the last in this great book. Revelation 22, verse 6. Last time we looked at the inner city of the New Jerusalem, how mind blowing, how breathtaking it will be with the radiance of the living God, and even the, the twelve pearls and the different diamonds, and the city is pure gold, and there's no need of the sun because God's radiance, the Lamb, Christ, the radiance of God, the place and glory of God will shine forever and ever. And it struck me at the end, especially in my prayer, I was overwhelmed with emotion regarding that we will reign. Verse 5 of chapter 22, for the Lord giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. It's not incredible, but we will reign with the Lord forever and ever. And um, it might feel a bit insignificant or inadequate in this world, but how the Lord is going to turn it right around, that we will reign with Him forever. And ever, and what prospect and what hope and what guarantee God has for His people in this glorious, wonderful place, the New Jerusalem. As the former things will pass away, this world will be burned up, and the Lord will usher in a new heavens and a new earth, and then heaven will descend into that wonderful environment where there is no sin, a place of complete and utter. Perfect harmony, perfect joy, perfect environment, perfect paradise, and what it is mind blowing that the Lord has for his redeemed people. So we're on verse 6, verse 6 of chapter 22 of the book of Revelation tonight. Um, John the Apostle here. And he said unto me, That's the angel, it's given the, the revelation. Given the vision of the, of the New Jerusalem. These signs are faithful and true. Because God is faithful and true. God cannot lie. It's impossible. It is unchanging. It is immutable. And the Lord God, the holy prophets, sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard and seen, and I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things, and then saith he unto me, See thou who do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets. And all them must keep the sayings of this book, worship God. Man must to worship man, and to love God, worship in this world of man, whatever it may be. But only God should be ascribed to worship. He is the only one worthy. And he said unto me, See not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. And that he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly. There's our phrase again. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I know the Lord bless these number of verses, these six verses to us this evening. At this point of this incredible book of Revelation, John has taken the reader on an amazing journey of future history, all the way to the eternal state. As we're well aware, people will go to the occult and they'll want to know about their future. 
If I'd only read and study this book, then I would certainly know about the future, what is to happen. And this book brings us right through to the eternal state. As last time we discovered the new Jerusalem and the new heavens on earth, fire it was sent into the new heavens on earth, a new environment for the people of God. All for John to record is this divine postscript. As all God's purposes before the foundation of the world have now come to pass, regarding the great tribulation, regarding the second coming of Christ, regarding his 1,000 year millennial kingdom, regarding sinners have been sentenced and cast into the lake of fire for eternity, regarding the new heavens and the earth have been created for the new Jerusalem where God's redeemed people, the Old Testament saints, the bride of Christ, the tribulation saints, the millennium saints will be forever and ever in this glorious place, the new Jerusalem, for eternity, worshipping, serving and reigning with Christ in his matchless, blazing, radiant glory in a perfect environment of love, peace, joy and fulfillment. It tells us here in chapter 22 how we will serve him. Verse 3, and his servants shall serve him. It tells us in verse 5, we will reign forever and ever with the Lord. We will worship him. And in this postscript, the final last time in scripture, God in his mercy invites sinners to come in repentance and save in faith in Jesus Christ before it is too late forever. Verse 17 of chapter 22. We'll look at the next time. It says, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst, Come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. What is the great invitation that, goes, that has been heard from the lips of Christ? Come now and let us raise with the gas. So I see in Isaiah. Come now and let us raise with the gas, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they should be white as snow or wool. And then the Lord Jesus, 3,000 years ago approximately, Come unto me, O ye labor and happy then, and I will give you rest. Have you come? Has it been a point in your life you've come God's way, Christ's way, the only way of redemption, the only way of salvation, the only way to have peace with God, the only way to have eternal life, that assurance in your own soul that you're saved, that you're going to glory in this great place called heaven, the only way to escape the wrath of God, the only way to escape the lake of fire, have you come? In these verses from 6 to 12 we have read this evening, and also verse 20, there is a great rapid fire acceleration, urgency regarding the imminent coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is repetition here. Repetition, even repetition. Verse 7 says, Behold, I come quickly. Verse 12 says, and Behold, I come quickly. Verse 20 says, Surely I come quickly. Repetition, rapid fire. I come quickly, the Lord says. The Lord Jesus, and I firmly believe by studying in a deeper way, have always held held that view, but nevertheless over the last number of months, because of our studies in Thessalonians and through the book of Revelation and even the Gospel of Mark, and I firmly believe that the Lord folks could come at any time, at any moment, to rapture his bride. It is imminent. Then judgment, and I believe the day of the Lord is not for the people of God, it is for, and the day of the Lord is for the sinners, for the Antichrist, and it's a great tribulation period. And the day of the Lord will begin. Just like us in the days of Noah. You see, if we were to go through the great tribulation, we would be aware and waiting and expecting the Lord's return, and we would be waiting, waiting, waiting up. There is a sea of judgment that has been let loose. 
just in the middle of great tribulation, and then slightly after that, then we have the the trumpet judgment when another third of mankind will be destroyed. There's already a quarter, another third, so that's over half of mankind. So surely, folks, if we were going through the great tribulation, the day of the Lord, we would be aware that Christ is coming at any day. But yet it tells us I come quickly. The rapture could come at any it's imminent. And that's why Jesus says in Matthew 24, and also in Mark 13, and in the Gospel of Luke, I think it's 17, Jesus says it'll be like in the days of Noah. Folks, the great tribulation will not be in the days like the days of Noah. Because it says they will be eating and drinking, getting on with their normal duties in life. Then Noah, what happened? He was shut in. And the flood, the judgment came. It was imminent. When people were not expecting it. And if God is going to send, and He will send, divide the whole judgments just preceding the return of Christ. Folks, if we were in the day of the Lord, and I don't get me wrong, some good men, students of the Word of God, maybe hold that view, and that's fine. But I hold this other view, and that's okay. Everybody in the room thinking. But, folks, the day of the Lord, or Christ's return, and the rapture, whatever view you want to come down up. The Lord is returning for his bride and it's going to be imminent. Behold, I come quickly. And I believe if we go through the great tribulation, the day of the Lord, since the day of wrath, we would be then watchful and aware of Christ's return for his people. But Jesus says, the lack of days in the world and the days of Lot. They were just getting on with their normal duties. The great tribulation period will not be normal duties. When God is pouring out his wrath upon this world in great judgments. The early church, including the Apostle Paul, believed that Christ's coming was imminent for his people. Even though uncertain recording the time frame, nevertheless, Paul even had in his own heart believed that Christ would come imminent at any time, even during his day when he lived on this earth. Because he realized he wasn't going through the Great Tribulation. Nevertheless, they were instructed to live wisely, being prepared for and expecting Jesus to return imminently at any moment. The Apostle Paul, referring to the rapture of the bride of Christ, states, Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the earth, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The faithful repetition here of the phrase, I come quickly, which we've read this evening, reinforces the reality of the imminent return of Jesus Christ for his bride. This phrase, quickly, now quickly, caught you in the Greek, does not simply refer to the speed of Christ's return from heaven to earth, but signifies soon or before long, pointing that the judge is standing right at the door, ready to return at any moment in God's perfect timetable. As the apologue opens, the angel which showed the apostle John the dazzling, breathtaking New Jerusalem previously declares to John that these sayings are faithful and true in verse 6. These sayings are faithful and true in verse 6 of our passage we've read this evening. This phrase, faithful and true, appears twice. Well, actually, three times in the book of Revelation. But it appears twice, referring as a title for the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember the account, maybe, right and go along ago, maybe six months ago or so, when we were looking at Christ's return in glory, the place in glory, at the, for the battle of Armageddon. He says, I saw a heaven open, and behold, the white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, referring to Jesus Christ coming back in blazing glory. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. What a day that will be. God, you see, is faithful and true. It's impossible for God to lie. God's character is that God cannot lie, it's impossible. God is holy. 
God is faithful and true. Verse 6. We cannot fail or lie on everything God declares or decrees will always come to pass. It is absolutely certain. It is sealed. It is guaranteed. God does not deceive or manipulate anyone. He is all truth. And every person will be judged from this wonderful book. This is God's revelation to us. God in his mercy and grace and loving kindness gave us this revelation. To warn us, to show us the way of redemption, to show us the way of salvation and a wonderful saviour, his only glorious son. The Lord does not deceive or manipulate anyone. He is all truth. He is faithful. And what God says in his word will always come to pass. No matter what generation, no matter what people try to do, to try to alter it or try to shut it out or try to, to, crush, to, to, to uh, crush it or whatever they want to try and do. Folks, it's impossible. God's word is eternal. It will always stand the test. His word is revealed, you see, and it is transparent. There's no hidden agendas to deceive anyone. God is transparent. He's given us his word, and nobody has any excuses as, as his word is pure, and it is light, and life. This book of Revelation is special. It is not mystical made up of bizarre dreams or over-exaggeration and hyper-imaginations with their fanciful spiritualizing ideas which some people come up with. No, it is a book of inerrant, infallible, 100% accurate descriptions of events and persons yet to come, inspired by the Holy Spirit as he superintended the prophets of old the Jews to write pen down the scriptures as Second Peter 1 tells us for the prophecy came not in the old time by the will of man but holy men of God spoke as were moved by the Holy Ghost. The book of Revelation is ultimately primarily focusing on the revelation of Jesus Christ and his blaze of glory the sovereign ruler of this universe. In which God will judge severely any person who adds or takes away the words of this prophecy. Verse 18 and 19 and 22 it says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of this book, prophecy, God shall take away his part in the book of life out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. The living God, the God of Revelation, who moved his holy prophets, 66 books, 64 books written by Jews, two written by Luke. God inspired who inspired these holy prophets to write the channel of scripture. The Old and the New Testament is the same God who sent his angel, who showed his servants what must come to pass in verse 6. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. God's infallible word with complete precision had already fulfilled former prophecies which came to pass. Such as Israel would go into captivity. Such as the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Such as the Messiah would be born to a virgin and then be killed and rise again. The Old Testament, you see the prophecies, is over 300 referring to the Messiah. So when God predicts future events such as the rapture, the 
great tribulation period, the rise of Antichrist, the rise of the false prophet, the sail, trumpet, vile, bowl, judgments, the bottle of Armageddon, the return of Christ, the millennial kingdom, the great white throne judgment, the eternal state, heaven on the lake of fire, those events will surely come to pass. As God declares the end from the beginning, the old prophet Isaiah says in 46, as history, folks, is God's story, in which no one can stay his hand, being the sovereign ruler of this universe. So the imminent return of the Lord calls for the response of every true believer. Regarding from these verses tonight, we're going to look up four different points. Obedience, true worship, proclamation and service. The imminent return of the Lord calls for the response of every true believer regarding obedience, true worship, proclamation and service. There is no mandate whatsoever for people to be sitting in the back in their armchair in a sense and just sitting back in their laziness and thinking I'm just waiting on the return of the Lord. There is no mandate whatsoever in the Bible for that. You see, the imminent return of the Lord calls for the response of every true believer regarding obedience, true worship, proclamation, and service. So first of all, here we have obedience, verse 7. Behold, I come quickly. These are the words of Christ here. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. The, the speaker changes, you see, from the angel. We know all every word in this book. It's from God, of course, God inspired, God breathed. But the speaker changes from the angel to the blessed Lord Jesus Christ in verse 7. Again, who speaks in his introduction as coming quickly, imminent. Behold, I come quickly, he says. The Lord pronounces the sixth of the seventh Beatitudes in the book of Revelation. Blessed, happy is he. It's a quality of life in a sense. Happy, blessed is that person. I come quickly, it says. Because why is that person happy? Why is that person blessed? Because that person is a doer, a keeper, being obedient to the word of God. Because in verse 7, behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of his book. That person is a doer. He's not just a, a listener, a hearer, but he keeps the sayings of this book, it says. He's about the master's business. He's a doer and a keeper, being obedient to the word of God, especially holding fast, guarding the book of Revelation, which largely, largely consists of future prophecies, predictions, and promises. Tonight, folks, believers are called to guard and protect, defend the word of God, especially the book of Revelation. Why is that? Well, we find out the way There's many scoffers against the word of God, especially the book of Revelation. There's many liberals out there who are against the word of God and the book of Revelation. There's many critics who deny its authenticity and authority as well as against confused, spiritualizing interpreters who misrepresent and obscure its meaning, the book of Revelation. So as believers, we need to guard and protect and defend the word of God as far as the book of Revelation. Why is that? Why has the book of Revelation been attacked more than any other book in the Bible? Because, folks, the devil hates the book of Revelation as it reveals he is completely defeated. And Jesus Christ is the all conquering sovereign one in blazing glory. The book of Revelation is really the revelation of Jesus Christ in blazing glory. 
That's what the book of Revelation is really about, folks, this context. This is why the book of Revelation will be assaulted from every angle with skeptics and even some, sad to say, of those people who are afraid of it and do not understand it, they leave it alone. There's ministers out there that have been in the ministry for 40 years and have never touched the book of Revelation. Shame on them. And yet, what is the Bible tell us at the very beginning of the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 1, the Apostle John, did I have such great insight before I started these studies a year and a half ago? No, folks, I have a study to understand it. And every minister should be the same, who's saved by the grace of God. Paul, or John says in Revelation 1, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, the book of Revelation he's speaking about, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. The word of God tells us that person is blessed when he reads the book of Revelation, and he hears the words of it, and also keep those things which are written therein. The book of Revelation, folks, should not fear but fear in the people of God. It should actually encourage us and inspire us because the book of Revelation is a book of victory and it's a book of the all-conquering, all-sufficient, all-sovereign ruler, Jesus Christ. Believers, of course, are not just called to guard and defend Scripture, but also to obey Scripture, which should be a general, consistent pattern of their daily conduct by walking in the light of God's word. Jesus himself says, if you love me, keep my commandments. The psalmist reminds us, thy word have I hid. Thy word have I hid, guarded in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. This is why Jesus says, behold, in verse 7, I come quickly, blessed is he that keepeth, or guardeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book, Get the book in the heart, get the book into the soul, the mind, the emotion, the will. Those whose mindset is on things above, eternal values, and believe that Jesus could return imminently for his bride, the true church, at any time will be inspired to live in obedience in the light of that subject, to God's word being watchful, alert, not in a spiritual slumber or lazy, casual in the things of God. It should inspire the people of God realizing that Christ, the living Savior, could return any time for his bride. God does not command to obey, take heed to the signs of the prophecy of this book of Revelation to merely satisfy their curiosity about the future. Nor to speculate cultural, political, military, or social events by trying to spiritualize injecting their thoughts by events into the book of Revelation, in which we get a catalogue of books shared out on prophecy on all types of fancy folk spiritualized ideas from people go off and conscience. No God has inspired the book of Revelation for one purpose. To reveal the blaze and glory of his wonderful Son, Jesus Christ, and to call all believers to live godly, obedient lives in the light of his word and soon return. It is not entertainment for curious speculations or so called prophetic speculations, but to provide motivation for godly living. What did Peter say? He reminds us in the future day of the Lord and the destruction of this present universe and coming to the new heaven and earth. He says this, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? And John the Apostle himself says, And every man that have this hope in him, purify himself even as he is pure, referring to the Lord returning for his bride. You see, folks, the imminent return of Christ, behold, I come quickly, should motivate us, motivate, inspire God's people in the godly level. So our first point tonight is obedience. Godly living regarding the imminent return of Christ, behold, I come quickly. 
Keep the sayings of the prophecy. He says, in other words, live a godly life. Obey my word. Keep my commandments. Hide them in your heart. Be a hearer of the word of God. Not just a hearer. The very quick as we go on. Secondly, the imminent return of Christ calls for the response of every true believer in true worship. True worship. Verse 8 and 9. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. When John seen and heard these wonderful things, he was overwhelmed and amazed by falling down to worship. But John's worship was directed to the wrong person, the wrong object, knowing himself that the angels were not to be worshipped as he had been rebuked earlier in attempting to do so in Revelation 19, but in a sense was like Ezekiel and Daniel overwhelmed in amazement who collapsed in wonder and worship. The angel here did not elevate himself above the Apostle John despite his superiority, but actually declared to John that he was his great fellow servant, not just to John, but also to all the saints who worship God, verse 9. Then saith they unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God, he says. Throughout the scriptures, angels are seen serving God's people. They strengthen and protect believers. Hebrews 1 explains, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to serve for them who shall be heirs of salvation? God dispatches angels at times to render service to those who will inherit salvation to help God's redeemed people. What about you go right back to the book of Genesis? Angels, you see, sometimes come in human form. Two came to rescue Lot from the destruction of Sodom. The angel call, calls the bewildered apostle John here to worship God alone. The only true worthy object of worship as God will not share his glory with another as he is the transcendent self-existent independent supreme one. The Bible expresses clearly that God alone is to be worshipped and totally forbids the worship of angels, of saints, of the Virgin Mary or any other created beings. Of course, people not saved will worship sports stars, music stars, film stars, they'll worship whatever they can worship themselves, which is idolatry. God forbids idolatry, and no idolatry will enter the kingdom of God. The angel says to John, Worship God. Thirdly, the imminent return of the Lord calls for the response of every true believer to proclamation. That's why the sign of first time earlier, sign the gospel of grace abroad, there's life in the risen Lord. Proclamation. Verse 10 of Adam, and he saith unto me, Say not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Proclamation, you see, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still, and he that is tough, let him be tough still, and he that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. God has given us the name people, the church, the bride, the privilege to share his message of the glorious gospel to a fallen world, to a fallen mankind, which should inspire us even more, especially born people in love, that the Lord could return at any time, eminently in which they need to be ready, need to be prepared. The word of God, especially the book of Revelation, you see, is not sealed, but it is to be proclaimed in verse 10. And he said to me, See not, it says. Don't be disclosing it. Reveal it. See not the signs of this prophecy, of this book. 
Proclaim it. Don't shut it up. Don't hide it away. But reveal. Warn people to love the fame of the return of Christ. Because God has given his people the privilege and honor. And the only message, the only true answer regarding salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. As Paul could proclaim, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for support of God and salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And Paul, and God has given his people that wonderful privilege to share the gospel. Not to shut it up, but to proclaim it, to hurl it, and love solemnly warning that. If these people continue on their lifestyle, which also determines their character, and their character determines their destiny, they will end up perishing because the pattern of your life, bad, sinful, or bad, is godly, will determine, of course, it will be godly if Jesus Christ is your Savior. It will be ungodly if He's not your Savior, because in verse 11 it says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, that will be filthy still. And he that is righteous, that will be righteous still. And he that is holy, that will be holy still. You should know a true believer by the pattern of their life, said. God's people walk in the light. They walk in love. God's people have a desire for the things of God. The Lord's return will be so imminent. People will be called out and have no time whatsoever to change their characters. It will be too late as they have continued to harden their hearts and rebellion and their sin and the sovereign to realize that people's response to the call, God's gospel and Jesus Christ will determine their eternal destiny. What think you of Christ? Is the question, what think you of Christ? Is it heaven or hell? There's no neutral middle ground. What a person does with Christ, and of course Christ is the one that deals with the person, but nevertheless, what think you of Christ will determine what person's destiny, heaven or hell? People end up in the lake of fire because they are Christ rejectors. The truth of the gospel proclaimed either becomes an instrument of salvation or an instrument of damnation. This is why it is essential to sure proclaim the gospel while there is still time. Because the Lord is coming quickly, imminent. And we have been given the privilege and honour to proclaim. Not to seal the prophecy of this great book, but to proclaim the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ to have fallen mankind. Finally, as we learn, the end of the turn of the Lord calls the response of every true believer to immediate service. Immediate service. That's why we sang that hymn, that last verse, when you do service for Jesus your King. Verse 12, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. His immediate service. Again, the Lord reinforces again his imminent return. Behold, I come quickly. He said in Mark 13, his disciples, referring to the Olivet Discourse, Take you heed, watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. The Lord will reward his people according to their faithfulness in serving Christ on this earth. 12b. To give every man according as his work shall be. The greater the believer's faithfulness in this life. That's why it's so important, folks. We only get one opportunity in this life. The greater the believer's faithfulness in this life will expand to even greater opportunities and capacities in the service of the Lord and heaven for eternity. 
There is different rewards in heaven. The service of the Lord is never in vain. It is always an investment of sparsity for the eternal realm. Of course, many, which is understandable, are saved or conformed to the things of this world. But not just them, also some professing believers are investing, putting their energies into the temporal world system and realm. But they have to leave it all behind, whether it's through death, and they eventually they burned up anyway with fervent heat. As the elements will be burned up, Second Peter 3, and that's why the Lord says, Look, not the things of this world. Again, there's nothing wrong with women's song. But the Lord's blessed you with it as long as it doesn't own you. But folks, be careful that it doesn't become an idol in the heart and the things of God become sacrificed. Because the reality is it's going to be burned up anyway. We're going to leave it behind. Surely it is wise to invest in God's kingdom. It can't fail. A man here invests in their bank accounts. There's not no one that's wise, of course, to be good stewards. But folks, those bank accounts are going to be burned up someday. They're no value for the kingdom of God. If they're not used for the kingdom of God. It's wise to build their treasures for glory. Through prayer, through service, through obedience to God's word. Through faithfulness, through commitment, through being sacrificial and faithfulness by producing diligent, worshipful service to God and proclaiming the glorious gospel to the unsaved. There is no biblical mandate whatsoever of being careless, lukewarm, lazy because we believe Jesus is coming soon, sitting back and relaxing. No, it shall inspire and motivate the people of God to be living in godly lives and be about the Master's business, warning people in love that the Christ could return at any time, and then judgment upon this world, the day of the Lord. What a great honour and privilege it is, and it's difficult at times, folks, nobody's disputing that. But what a great honour and privilege it is to serve and worship the Lord, being labourers to gather with Him. He doesn't need us, but He gives us the privilege and honour. He's ordained it that way. He gives us the privilege and honour to be labourers to gather with Him. Whether it's full time ministry, whether it's in the school place, whether it's in the university, whether it's in the home place, whether it's in the workplace. Whether it's amongst family or wherever, or friends or whoever, the Lord has given us the wonderful honour and privilege to serve Him, to worship Him, being labourers to gather with Him, who cannot fail, is not wonderful, as He will build His church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, as He shall see the travail of His soul, and shall be satisfied with it. As a close, someone said, O oh Lord, let me not live to be useless. The gospel is not something that we come to church to hear. It is something we go from church to hell. O oh Lord, let me not live to be useless. The gospel is not something we come to church to hear. It is something we go from church to hell. So the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ calls for the response of every true believer regarding obedience. Keep the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Guard it, protect it, get it into the heart, get it into the mind. It also records true worship. God alone is to be worshipped, not man, not a pastor, not anybody else, not a denomination. Most of no flesh, the Bible says. The imminent return of the Lord calls for the response of every true believer regarding proclamation. Go into the Lord and preach the gospel to every creature. 
On the imminent return of the Lord calls for the response of every true believer of boarding service. How is our service to the Lord tonight? In which there's many different phases of boarding service for his glory. Will it be one hair stubble? Or will it be well done, thy good and faithful servant? Gold, silver, precious stones. A many who profess the name of Christ tonight, especially in this one, they are losing out, and they're losing out for eternity. I trust that we will not be foolish, but we will be wise and invest in the kingdom which cannot fail, God's eternal kingdom. Because, folks, behold, Jesus says, I come quickly. I believe with all my heart by the study of God's word that the Lord could come at any time for his church. Or we're ready, or we're prepared, or we live in body lives, and all about the master's business investing in his kingdom. The Lord bless you three words to us. See them. We'll have a word of prayer. Time is done. We'll not say our last time. And uh, there's a cup of tea after our time of fellowship. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, O oh God, that you've called us unto obedience, unto true worship, unto never to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You've called us unto service. And Father, of all different gifts you've given us, you've bestowed upon us through the Holy Ghost. Have us, O oh God, to exercise them for your glory and for the edification of the saints. O oh God, we thank you and we praise you that Christ is returning. And O oh God, what a glorious, blessed hope it is for the people of God that you're going to take us out of this evil, sinful, crooked, perverse world we live in. And we're going to be with the Lord forever, worshiping Him, serving Him, and also reigning with Him forever and ever. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for what Thou hast purchased for Thy people, Thy redeemed people. We thank you tonight that, O oh God, You've included us in Your church. We rejoice in Thee, and we bless Thee, and we thank Thee, O oh God, for Your wonderful redemption. And Father, in these days, I pray that help us. O oh God, to set our affections in the things above. And of course, we have to get on with the main things of life, the temporal issues. But we do thank you for every temporal blessing also. But O oh God, I pray, help us that we'll not be paupers, that we'll not, O oh God, be empty handed at the judgment seat of Christ. But it will be well known, thy faithful and good servant. Father, I pray, O oh God, that thou will bless our time of fellowship now. Thank you for every person who's gathered. Pray, Lord God, you'll watch over us this week until we meet up again in the sure will of Jesus Christ. Said, Amen. 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 Thank you.